My love for space started when I was about five. On the coffee table at my cousin's house, there was a National Geographic book called Our Universe. It's filled with amazing, imagination-inspiring art. Starting with this picture on the cover of this beautiful interstellar cruise ship. There's also depictions of the Roman gods that each of the planets were named after. This is Luna, who's always my favorite. They also have these fantastical creatures that they imagined living in our solar system. These are creatures they imagined floating in the atmosphere of the gas giant Jupiter. And these are hyperintelligent blue crystals they imagined living on Pluto. There's also pictures of what cities in space would look like, giant rings filled with lush green biospheres. Between this book and wanting to be Princess Leia from Star Wars, <laughs> I was hooked on space. I knew I belonged in that future. I wanted to be a part of opening up space for humanity. Now, that wonder and awe, I never grew out of it. When I graduated from college um, as an astrobiologist, I moved to Houston, Texas, to work in the astronaut office at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I was starry-eyed and on a mission. I wanted to find out firsthand from the NASA astronauts if flying in space could be as impactful and life-altering as I believed. You see, in college, I read a Frank White's book, The Overview Effect, and everything in me wanted to believe that what it said was true, that flying in space has a profound impact on people, and it leaves them with a sense of oneness with their home planet and everyone on it. One hot Houston afternoon, I was working on astronaut evaluation of some space station medical hardware. One of the astronauts who was supporting the evaluation was Dr. Charles Brady. Brady had just gotten back to Houston from his first space shuttle mission. He had landed just a few weeks ago. I felt like he still had magic space dust on him. <laughs> After the evaluation, he told me how hard it was to just go back to business as usual. Um, he said, they want me to go back to my desk job, but all I want to do is shout from the mountaintops, I just got back from space. <laughs> we became friends. He needed someone to talk to about everything he had just seen and felt and experienced. And I was willing to listen to as much as he could tell me. He shared a story about how he'd worked for months to try to think about which 10 music CDs he was going to bring with him on a space flight. This was the 90s. <laughs> Finally, he got it all worked out. The perfect spectrum of musical options. In the end, though, during his 16 days in space, he said that the only city that was a match for the majesty and the grandeur of what he was experiencing was Handel's Messiah. During his time off, floating in front of the space shuttle windows, he would look down at the earth and listen to that one CD over and over again. Brady loved looking at the Earth from space. He had worked hard for years to fight for Earth, to protect its wild rivers, to share its beauty with others. Looking down on our home world from space touched him deeply and reignited his passion to protect our home world. Brady also taught me a valuable lesson. One day at work, one of the guys made an off-color comment about environmentalists that threw me into a rage. I was beside myself. How could this guy be a part of our space program? Brady calmly told me that this guy was one of the best in the country at what he does. 
and that NASA and we were lucky to have him. Brady taught me to breathe, to not be so quick to judge, and to appreciate that it takes many different kinds of people to get to space. We can all use the perspective that space gives us to grow. We have a huge opportunity right now to use the power of space to make us better people and a better species. If we're the same jerks on Mars that we are here, we will have failed. We started a training program for space engineers, technologists, te technicians, and staff at Virgin Galactic. The goal is to help us be compassionate, empowered, and authentic. We practice taking better care of ourselves and each other. We work to loosen the grip of anger, fear, and aggression. We call it the new right stuff. One of the first assignments is to explore what your mission is. What did you come to Earth to do? You also commit to doing one new thing that you're going to do every day. It's designed to interrupt your autopilot and have you in action, creating the life that you want. You also get a buddy to help hold you, hold you accountable. In class, we do things like role play, an engineer telling his boss that he missed a deadline. The participants take turns being the nervous engineer and the raging boss. The participants get to experience what it's like to be belittled and yelled at in their body. And then we stop. We do the role play again. This time, the boss is calm. He sits down next to the engineer, and he says, what ideas do you have to get us back on track? The engineers feel, the, the participants feel the difference in their body, in their confidence, their motivation, and their loyalty. Halfway through the training, we do a high ropes course. It's a fantastic opportunity to practice power, compassion, and authenticity in a high-pressure situation 40 feet off the ground. When you're standing at the top of the telephone pole, about to jump for the trapeze, will you trust yourself? Can you let go of your drive to get to the top first to help your teammate on the wall? How authentic are you willing to be with the group about your fears and what support you need? Over the course of the training, participants shift who they're being at work and at home. They listen more. They take responsibility more. I've seen participants patch up relationships with colleagues they couldn't work with and parents they haven't spoken to in years. One trainee came in at the beginning of the course and said a relationship with a colleague had just dropped to 0%, a relationship he called irreparable. By the end of the training, he reported that that relationship had improved to 80%. These shifts have a huge impact on the quality of life of the staff. It also greatly improves the quality of the projects that they're working on. And it opens up the possibility of a new future for humanity, one where we all hold ourselves to a higher bar. That's where it gets interesting. The next 50 years, we have the opportunity to set the tone for what we want the future of our civilization to be. Who we're being and what we learn in that time will alter the trajectory of humankind. I invite you to create a community around you to help you be who you've always wanted to be, 
and to fulfill what you came to earth to do. Together, we could transform life on this planet and wherever we choose to go. Thank you.